recycling a matter and ecosystem. In this lesson, we're talking about the water cycle, the carbon cycle, the nitrogen cycle, and the phosphorus cycle. Biogeochemical cycles. Matter cannot be created or destroyed. All water and nutrients must be produced or obtained from chemicals already present in the environment. This happens through biogeochemical cycles, which is the movement of matter through the biotic and abiotic environment. So what that means is that the hydrogens and oxygens that were present in the water 65 million years ago are the same hydrogens and oxygens that are present today. They may not be in the same form, they may not be in the form of water, but they are still around. The hydrogens weren't created, they just moved from one thing to the other. So we're going to investigate four biogeochemical cycles. The water cycle, the carbon cycle, the nitrogen cycle, and the phosphorus cycle. So first up, the water cycle, otherwise known as the hydrologic cycle. So liquid water evaporates, forming water vapor that moves through the atmosphere. So we have that right here, evaporation. The water vapor condenses, forming liquid water and ice, which falls to Earth. So we get our condensation, it's going to come to the clouds, and then it's going to fall as precipitation back down to Earth. Fallen water moves around Earth's surfaces as lakes and rivers and oceans. Water is taken up by plants and is released via transpiration or consumed by animals. So we have our transpiration over here. That's the plants releasing the water into the atmosphere, which can then go back via condensation to clouds. And then animals can also come along and eat the plants, in which case the liquid water would go into them. I'd like you to pause the video and watch number two. This is Bill Nye's take on the water cycle, and it's really well done. The second cycle is the carbon cycle. In the carbon cycle, carbon is cycled through the lithosphere, that's not going to be our rock, our atmosphere, air, and hydrosphere, water, as well as the biosphere. Carbon is an important element because it's the building block of all living things. So the carbon that's in rocks can be broken down, released into the atmosphere, and then taken in via photosynthesis to create sugar. The plants can then be consumed by our animals, and that sugar can be converted into energy and other products via cellular respiration. In the case of cellular respiration, carbon dioxide is released back into the atmosphere, and the cycle can keep going over and over and over again. So as I just touched on, carbon is cycled in the carbon cycle through several processes, but mainly through photosynthesis and cellular respiration. Photosynthesis is when carbon dioxide is brought into the plants. It's then used to create organic carbon, which can be consumed by animals, which are then going to release the carbon back into the atmosphere as CO2 via cellular respiration. Other processes that affect the carbon cycle. A huge amount of carbon is dissolved in the ocean. So if you have oceans, you're going to constantly get carbon moving out of and into the oceans, as the oceans are a really large area for carbon to be dissolved in. As it moves out of the oceans, it's generally in the form of carbon dioxide. And then that carbon dioxide can then move back into the oceans and be stored as carbonic acid generally. Bogs can also store huge amounts of organic carbon. Bogs are things like swamps, and it's stored via the decaying matter, which is often trapped where no oxygen is available to decompose it. So things like our trees and animals that get stuck in the bog, while the oxygen can't get at it, so that carbon stays as is inside the bog. And then humans are going to increase the amount of carbon dioxide in the air by burning fossil fuels and by removing vegetation. So by clear cutting and burning forests, we're going to release a lot of carbon dioxide into the air. Also, by removing trees, we're going to reduce our ability to take that carbon out of the air through photosynthesis, like we showed right here. And by burning fossil fuels, we're going to release a significant amount of carbon dioxide into the air as well. By changing where our carbon is located, we're going to significantly affect the carbon cycle. Now, regarding human activity, well, if we heat up the earth, we're going to significantly increase the amount of carbon dioxide that's released from the oceans because we're going to evaporate more ocean water. That's going to send more carbon dioxide into the air, which is going to change the balance between the ocean air concentration levels. Clear-cutting forests are going to decrease our ability to take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. And by increasing fossil fuel usage, we're going to also increase the amount of carbon dioxide in the air. So human activities are going to significantly increase the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which significantly alters the carbon cycle. So I mentioned it previously. What I'd like you to do now is pause the video and answer the question, why does removing plants increase carbon dioxide in the air? By getting rid of plants, what we do is we prevent trees from taking up carbon dioxide for photosynthesis. If there's less trees available, less carbon dioxide will be pulled from the atmosphere, and this will lead to more carbon dioxide being in the air. And here's our equation for photosynthesis. So you can see if we decrease the amount of trees, we're going to decrease the amount of carbon dioxide that's taken up in photosynthesis, and as a result, we're going to increase the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Our third cycle is the nitrogen cycle. This is a series of processes in which nitrogen compounds, nitrates, are moved through the biotic and abiotic environment. Most of the nitrogen is taken from the atmosphere, and that's in the form of N2, by soil bacteria in a process called nitrogen fixation. And you can see that right here. Here's our atmospheric nitrogen, our N2, and you can see it's being brought into the soil, and that process is nitrogen fixation. Nitrogen in the soil is available to producers and passes from producer to consumer through the food web. So you can see how the plants are going to be taking up nitrogen, and these plants are going to be eaten by consumers. These consumers are going to take the nitrogen, and when they die, bacteria is going to take that organic matter and put the nitrogen back into the soil which can then be picked up again by plants, and the cycle is going to continue all over again. Additionally, we can have denitrifying bacteria, which is going to take that dead organic matter and send the nitrogen back into the atmosphere. And that process is seen right here. So you can see how the denitrification is going to take our nitrates and send our nitrogen back into the atmosphere. So just to review, 
we can have atmospheric nitrogen coming into the soil here, becoming our nitrates, which can then be taken out by plants and then consumed by consumers. Our consumers will then die, and that organic matter will pass back into the soil and become available within the soil to plants to be taken up or sent back into the atmosphere by our denitrifying bacteria, which will send it back into the atmosphere. And then lastly, our fourth cycle, our phosphorus cycle, is when phosphorus is cycled between the biotic and abiotic environment. For the most part, phosphorus is stored in the lithosphere. That's our rocks and sediment. When rocks are broken down, phosphorus is released as phosphates. That's going to be our PO4-3 negative and into the soil. Phosphorus is also used in many fertilizers and detergents, which can leak into waterways. So you can see our human impact. We can release phosphorus via fertilizer into the waterways, and then through weathering and erosion, a lot of phosphorus can make its way down from rocky areas and also into the waterway. Once it's in the waterway, it can be taken up by marine plants and marine animals, and eventually it can be sent back into the sediment to be brought back up into the rocky layer, which would eventually be weathered and broken down, and the cycle would continue. On land, phosphorus is absorbed by plants as PO4-3 negative. Animals then eat the plants and the phosphorus is transferred to them. So you can see here our PO4-3 negative is absorbed by plants through the soil, which is then eaten by our consumers. And you can see that over here. So our plants are going to be consumed by our animals. Our animals are eventually going to die, which is going to send the phosphorus back into the soil, which can then be taken back up by the plants or sent via drainage back to our waterways and our sediment to recycle the phosphorus further. Phosphorus is a key component of life, making up a vital component of DNA and other life-sustaining molecules. So you can see the phosphorus here, 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 here. It makes up the backbone of each strand of DNA. When the animals and plants die, decomposers, bacteria, break down the dead organism and release the phosphorus back into the soil, continuing the cycle. And that's shown on the right-hand side here. Phosphorus makes its way into our waterways from fertilizer runoff, human activity, and when it's released from phosphate-containing rock via weathering. So as I was talking about, there's our fertilizer runoff and our weathering and erosion brings our phosphorus to our rivers that way as well. Once you've watched video five, you've completed the lesson on cycling of matter.